writers and the great thinkers. Uh, so I use, I, I mine the great novelists and the great philosophers, uh, and I think these are, are really the forerunners of our field. So Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, those are wonderful examples of awakening experience. And in the, in the text I use perhaps the most familiar literary one, which is, is Scrooge Awakening in Christmas Carol. I just saw that again at the at the at Christmas time at ACT, and uh, you know Scrooge is a, is a wonderful example of this mean spirited old man everyone dislikes he dislikes everyone else, and by the end of the story, you know he's rich uh, he's generous uh, and loved, and and what changed him? You know it it really wasn't Christmas cheer. What changed him was that Dickens delivered a really powerful kind of existential therapy. He sent the angel of the future there, yanked him into the future, let him witness his death, let him witness people dismissing his death in a casual way. And in the very last scene before Scrooge's transformation, he's in the churchyard fingering his name, the letters of his name on his tombstone. Next scene, he's a changed man. That's a beautiful example for me of an awakening experience. I thought of one, too, in reading your book. Uh, a friend of mine who died a couple of years ago, who was, we used to joke about how lugubrious he was. He seemed to carry sorrow with him all the time mm. and was dying and knew he was dying and was literally on his deathbed and he had his children around him and his grandchildren around him. And suddenly I saw a euphoria there mm. that I, an intensity and a passionate sense of, well, you call it rippling, I mm -hmm. guess. I mean, rippling's a good word. Let's yeah. talk about that. What is that? Well, I'm, I'm looking at the various ways we can help attenuate, help lessen our fears of oblivion and death anxiety. And, and I, I, I like the idea of rippling. And by that, I mean, just think of throwing a stone in a, in, a, in a pond and you get these ripples going on and on and on. And I think it's that way for us. Our personal identity won't be extended, but some part of us, some act of virtue, some aspect, some trait uh, ripples on and on and on and influences others who may not know us, but we, we persist in that way. I went to a memorial of uh, a very close friend who, who died, and the memorial was just a, uh, a few days ago. This is Diane Middlebrook, who may well have been on your show at other times. She was time. a friend of mine as well. Yes, and uh, there was an example where someone talked about her stride, and she said that she had this wide, confident stride, and the person speaking was a student of hers and said that she had learned it from her and used her as she walked across the, uh, the at Stanford campus. Now she says her daughter, who's now a sophomore in college, seems to march this way all on her, on her own and, and will pass it on to others. So parts of Diane, uh, without even their knowing that it's Diane, get passed on and on and on. Uh, it happens very often, for example, with school teachers. It happens for therapists. You know, it, it happens for parents. Uh, so I, I, I like the idea of rippling and its a way of keeping in mind that, that, uh, that a passage is not the same as, as oblivion. But you also remind us we die alone. You also remind us that our memories die with us mm -hmm. and that the sense of, of all of those memories that are only ours that have you know, our individual identity stamped on them are gone. And there's a difficulty sometimes in not really facing that kind of ephemerality because it's it can be overwhelming. Yeah, you know, that's something I have a quote in here somewhere by Kondera who talks about that we have a taste of death and simply forgetting because one aspect, you know, if you ask people a question, and I do ask people this who are dealing with that issue, it's, I, I have to, I have to almost start off by apologizing. Listen, I want to ask you a very simple, stupid question, but what is there about death? What in particular most concerns you, most frightens you? And people will answer in very different ways. Uh, and one of the ways they'll talk about, uh, that some people will talk about is the idea that their own personal world will disappear. There is a world that you have constituted, you've constructed all the precious memories and sensations that you've had in your life they really only belong to you and that world's going to go forever you know we've each we've each constituted our own lives in our own world and it's different from anyone else's constitution of the world 
that goes too and that's for some people that's a very painful part of 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 oblivion of dying it's it is for me i i have a, a great sensation of that well, you try to capture some of those memories in here in fact uh, your cat and the first time you encountered death of the kid in yeah. the second third grade Irvin yalom is our guest his book is staring at the sun overcoming the terror of death kichel we even have you know <laughs> these kinds of things that just flow out of memory uh are certainly a float out of your memory. Um, you mentioned E. Cummings' uh, poem, uh, Buffalo Bill, where he says, you know, Mr. Death. So it suddenly occurred to me, death is always in a male figure, isn't it? Never comes to us as a female figure. Fate comes to us as a female figure, but not death. Yeah, the, the Grim Reaper. Uh, maybe in the some... The guy with the scythe. Uh, yeah. Um, yes, he is, a, he is a male figure. Uh, I think maybe in in some Hindu some Hindu myths maybe death might be a female, but but usually it's a it's a male figure. Yeah. Well, so is God, of course. And you uh, well, you yeah. go you go into this existential uh, philosophy of yours here, and it doesn't include God, it doesn't include religion. Uh, and to some of your patients, uh, religion and God are a great deal of comfort, a great source of comfort. Sure. Yeah, that's a it's an important issue. You know, I, I'm I'm writing about death. And I'm defining death in an existential way that we're finite, that we're mortal, that death is the end. And I'm, I'm therefore by definition excluding other views of death, which de-deathifies death with saying, oh, it's not an end. You know, it may be the beginning. It may be the, the, uh, the doorway to another kind of life. So, uh, uh, so I'm, by definition, I'm not talking about those, but, but I, I have to, I have to answer and talk about your comment about religion because that's so important because my priorities as a therapist say, uh, there, there's one priority which is uh, supersedes all others, which is caring for the patient. If, if if one of my patients is gets comfort from religious views, gets comfort from a idea of the afterlife, uh, I, it would be unthinkable for me to try to challenge that or try to remove something that gives them comfort. And I give some examples of this in the book. In fact, I go in the other direction. I work with a priest who and for uh, most of his uh, adult life has gotten a great deal of comfort from 5 a.m. conversations with Jesus and become so uh, oppressed with issues going on in his in his parish that he has stopped doing that. Well, my, my tendency is to take a look at why is he depriving himself of that comfort. Uh, so I'm interested... By and large, uh, first of all, in the in the comfort and the well-being of the patient, not my own ideological beliefs. But this book is clearly written in in a secular existential mode, and I'm taking uh, making the basic assumption that we are thrown into this world alone. We will we'll leave it alone. That we're mortal. There's no afterlife, and we can't be threatened or harmed by anything in the afterlife, which can be, for many, an important source of comfort. What do you do with the notion that uh, some who follow your line of thinking are more prone to transgressive behavior because there is nothing to keep them from that transgressive behavior, and that could be indeed a way of trying to defy Mr. Death? Transgressive behavior, aggressive behavior, you mean. Or transgressors. I said, <laughs> Some, you can use well, you know, one. I think that's in in the uh, that's uh, sort of the old Dostoevskian uh, argument in the Brothers Karamazov. The idea, well, if there's no God, then anything is anything, permissible. Anything is permissible. Yeah. Anything is permissible. Right. But I don't think that's true. You know, I think it's a I think it's a myth that religion is the uh, is the uh, mother of morality. And, um, you know, it's certainly an issue that in my, my previous book, novel, uh, on Schopenhauer, that's an issue he, uh, he really, uh, tried to make that, that, that religion is not the mother of morality. There are many sources of morality. In fact, if we look at what's happening in the world today, uh, we see, uh, religious conviction and strife and, and, uh, as a source of a great deal of discord and, and pain in our world. Uh, I think there are, I think a, a confrontation with death, a real confrontation with that is, it also leads to a sense, as it did, for example, in, in even Ilyich, leads to a strong sense of compassion with all others. The idea that everyone is in this together, uh, that we're, there's a certain kind of linkage that we have between us. We're all facing, and this goes for therapists as well, we're all facing this together, we're fellow travelers. And 
leads to a great sense of, of compassion to others rather than to aggressivity. And human connectedness, I think, is the other human side of this that you, that you right. point out, uh, which leads me back to the old idea, the idea of self-disclosure for the therapist. Again, this is a way of bringing forth his or her humanity, and this is something that, well, you champion, really. I, 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 do. I do. I do feel that, that the very cornerstone of a therapeutic relationship is, is authenticity. And that means to recognize that you, too, have these kinds of issues and, um, and the, that you're, 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 in a sense, fellow, fellow travelers. And a certain amount of, 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 of self-revelation is, is essential. I think you see that for the first time in a, in a mass media in this, this new show on 